Our guests from the Chilcotin First Nation are Chief Joe Alphonse, Chief Russell Myers Ross, Chief Francis Lassis, Chief Roy Stump, Chief Otis Guichon Sr., Chief Jimmy Lula. The Right Honorable Prime Minister. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Aujourd'hui, nous sommes ici ensemble, en présence des chefs du Tiltcotin, pour reconnaître les actions perpétrées par les gouvernements du passé contre les Tiltcotin et pour exprimer les profonds regrets du gouvernement du Canada pour ces gestes. Today, we come together in the presence of the Chilcotin chiefs to fully acknowledge the actions of past governments committed against the Chilcotin people and to express the Government of Canada's profound regret for those actions. We also come together out of recognition and respect for the Chilcotin Nation, a vital partner in Canada's ongoing nation-to-nation -nation effort towards reconciliation. Today, we honour and recognize six Chilcotin chiefs, men who were treated and tried as criminals in an era where both the colonial government and the legal process did not respect the inherent rights of the Chilcotin people and the Chilcotin nation. As the government and the people of Canada continue to come to terms with our colonial past, it is essential that we recognize and support the implementation of the rights of the Chilcotin and all Indigenous peoples enshrined in our Constitution. The recognition and implementation of Indigenous rights can wait no longer, and neither should the Tsilkotin people continue to wait for an apology that is long, long overdue. Monsieur le Président, longtemps avant l'arrivée des Européens, les Tsilkotins prenaient soin de leur territoire et le protégeaient. Au printemps 1864, les chefs des Tsilkotins ont mené une expédition de guerre pour défendre ce territoire. Long before the arrival of Europeans, the Chilcotin people cared for and protected their homelands. In the spring of 1864, the Chilcotin chiefs led a war party in defense of those homelands. The chiefs were attempting to repel a colonial road crew that wanted to build a road through Chilcotin territory without any legal agreement with the Chilcotin nation. The rights of the Chilcotin in people to their land and their right to maintain and uphold their cultural and legal traditions were not considered by the colonial government of the day. As settlers came to the land in the rush for gold, no consideration was given to the needs of the Chilcotin people who were there first. No agreement was made to access their land, no consent was sought. At the same time, along with settlement came smallpox, which devastated Indigenous communities across the continent, including the Chilcotin. Some reliable historical accounts indicate that the Chilcotin had been threatened with the spread of disease by one of the road workers. And so, faced with these threats, the Chilcotin people took action to defend their territory. After convening a council to declare war, they attacked the road crew near Butte Inlet and removed all settlers from their lands before taking refuge in their territory beyond the reach of the colonial militia. Peu de temps après, l'un des dirigeants de la milice coloniale, William Cox, commissaire de l'or, a envoyé au chef Tsilkotin une offrande sacrée de tabac accompagné d'une invitation en vue de discuter les conditions de paix. Le chef de guerre, Clatosine, et ses hommes ont accepté cette rêve. Not long after, 
one of the leaders of the colonial militia, Gold Commissioner William Cox, sent the Tsukotin chiefs a sacred gift of tobacco, and with it, an invitation to discuss terms of peace. Head War Chief Katasain and his men accepted this truth. As a show of goodwill, they rode into the camp to negotiate peace. Instead of being welcomed as leaders and respected warriors, they were arrested, imprisoned, convicted, and killed. On October 26, 1864, five Tsirkotin chiefs were hanged for murder. Head War Chief Klatosain, Chief Biyil, Chief Telad, Chief Takot, and Chief Chesus. They are buried in Quinell, BC. Later, Chief Aun was also hanged. He is buried in New Westminster, BC. Monsieur le Président, aujourd'hui, notre gouvernement reconnaît ce que le gouvernement colonial de l'époque refusait d'accepter, que ces six chefs étaient des leaders et des guerriers de la nation des Tilcotines et que le peuple Tilcotine qu'ils dirigeaient conservait leurs droits sur un territoire qui n'avait jamais été cédé. Today, our government acknowledges that the colonial government of the day was unwilling to accept that these six chiefs were leaders and warriors of the Chilcotin nation, and that the Chilcotin people they led maintained rights to land that had never been ceded. Even though the colonial government did not recognize these rights, the chiefs acted in accordance with their own laws to defend their territory, their people, and their way of life. They acted as leaders of a proud and independent nation facing a threat from another nation. When they came to meet with colonial officials, they did so on a diplomatic mission, expecting to be treated with dignity and honor capture and arrest of the colonial government demonstrated a profound lack of respect for the Chilcotin people, as did the refusal to recognize Chilcotin as a nation. Those are mistakes that our government is determined to set right. Their capture and their arrestation by the colonial government manquaient profondément de respect for the Chilcotin de même que le refus de reconnaître les Tulcotines comme étant une nation. Ce sont des erreurs que notre gouvernement est déterminé à corriger. We now understand that the treatment of the Tulcotin chiefs represented a betrayal of trust, an injustice that has been carried by the Tulcotin people for more than 150 years even as they have continued to fight for and achieve recognition as the owners and caretakers of their land. Mr. Speaker, today the Tsirkotin people, including the descendants of those six chiefs, continue to live on and care for Tsirkotin lands. They have never stopped fighting to preserve their territory and their culture right up to the historic Supreme Court of Canada decision of June 26, 2014, which recognized Aboriginal title to the Chilcotin nation. The Chilcotin people and their leaders continue to show the same commitment to their land and to their nation that their chiefs did in 1864, pursuing government-to-government -government discussions with the government of British Columbia and the government of Canada with the goal of reconciliation and recognition as a self-determining First Nation. In February 2016, the Tsukotin Nation and British Columbia 
signed the Nenke Deni Accord, a significant step towards this goal. Less than a year later, in January 2017, we signed a letter of understanding between the Government of Canada and the Tsilkotin Nation, marking another step towards reconciliation and recognition of our new nation-to-nation -nation relationship. Mr. Speaker, we know that the exoneration and the apology we are making today on behalf of Canada cannot, by itself, repair the damage that has been done. But it is my sincere hope that these words will allow for greater healing as Canada and the Tsilkotin Nation continue on the shared journey towards reconciliation. At the same time, we would do well to acknowledge that for the Chilkotin people, the events of 1864 and 1865 are not confined to history. As a people, in particular the mothers that have passed this history down through generations, the Chilkotin have carried these events with them for more than a century and a half. The actions of the government of the day have had a deep and lasting impact on the relationship between the Tsukotin nation and Canada. Think of all we might have gained, Mr. Speaker, if proper relations between our nations had been established and maintained. Think of what it might have meant for the Tsukotin people to have true self-determination over their own future. Think of the economic opportunities might have been realized. Think of what Canada would have gained had we been open those many years ago to learning about the rich culture and traditions of the Chilcotin people and finding for it a lasting place within the fabric of Canada. For the loss of that time and opportunity, we are truly sorry. Dans la mesure où nous en avons le pouvoir, nous devons rectifier les erreurs du passé. Donc, pour signifier de manière décisive notre engagement envers la réconciliation, nous confirmons sans équivoque que le chef Klatosin, le chef Billil, le chef Tella, le chef Takut, le chef Chesus et le chef Aaron sont entièrement exonérés de tout crime et de tout méfait. As much as it is in within our power to do so, we must right the wrongs of the past. And so, as an important symbol of our commitment to reconciliation, we confirm without reservation that Chief Klatosain, Chief Biyil, Chief Telad, Chief Takut, Chief Chesus, and Chief Faun are fully exonerated of any crime or wrongdoing. of Chief Klatosain. They meant war, not murder. <coughs> we recognize that these six chiefs were leaders of a nation, that they acted in accordance with their laws and traditions, and that they are well regarded as heroes of their people. I very much look forward to visiting the declared Aboriginal title lands of the Chilcotin Nation this summer at the invitation of the Chilcotin leadership to deliver the statement of exoneration directly to the Chilcotin people who have fought so long and so hard to have the commitment and sacrifice of their war chiefs recognized. I suis impatient to visit the territory visé par the title of propriété autochtone of the Nation of Chilcotin this summer, 
à l'invitation des dirigeants des Tulcotines pour remettre en main propre la déclaration d'exonération pour laquelle les Tulcotines se sont battus depuis si longtemps et avec tant d'énergie en vue de reconnaître le dévouement et les sacrifices de leur chef de guerre. Acknowledging and apologizing for fast, past mistakes is an important part of renewing the relationship between Canada and the Tilkotin nation. But more hard work lies ahead. To, can you, to, to continue to work together in positive ways that affirm the government's respect and recognition of the rights of the Chilcotin people. To build a partnership that will support the Chilcotin people as they continue to preserve and strengthen their culture and traditions and govern and care for a territory as a flourishing nation. To embrace the Chilcotin nation and its rich contributions to the country that we all call home. To live up to the spirit of cooperation between our peoples, which has always been the unique strength and promise of Canada from its earliest days. As we honor the courage and sacrifice shown by the Chilcotin chiefs 154 years ago, we fulfill that strength and that promise. And we do it as we always should have, in partnership with respect together. Thank you. member for Kamloops, Thompson Caribou. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today on behalf of Canada's Conservatives to mark a somber milestone in the history of British Columbia and that of Canada. We hope that today's apology and exoneration will address some of the pain that still exists within the hearts of the Shilkotan people. Here in 2018, we may ask ourselves what an apology can achieve. Moments such as this cannot change behavior from another era or fix the past. We can, however, recognize the clear, lasting, and profound impact that former actions have had and the scars that have not been healed. We join in apology and recognition today to acknowledge how our shared history can create understanding in the present and cooperation in the future. More than 150 years ago, before Confederation, and at a time when Canada was a land equally steeped in opportunity and in conflict, the Shilkotin people found themselves face to face with newcomers to their homelands. As has happened so often throughout history, collisions between Indigenous people and new settlers lead to misunderstanding, fear, and violence. The Shilkotin facing a new presence on their homeland that was accompanied neither by meaningful outreach nor diplomacy did as many of us would have done. They sought to protect their communities. Open war was declared, and the pivotal moment in the conflict saw a confrontation between the Shilkotin and a group of workers near Butte Inlet. The Shilkotin began a campaign to remove settlers from their lands lands that had been arbitrarily declared open and free for access by arriving European people. As the war dragged on, an agreement was struck between the Silcotin and colonial representatives to meet to discuss diplomatic terms. In a clear act of betrayal, the Silcotin leaders, who had arrived unarmed to the meeting, were arrested and taken into custody. They were tried for murder. On October 26th, Five of the Silkotin chiefs were hanged, 
and a sixth in the following year. Chief Katasine, Chief Talad, Chief Biel, Chief Chasis, Chief Tackett, and Chief Un. The purpose of today's ceremony is to mark the exoneration of the Silcotin chiefs. Neither criminals nor aggressors, they may be regarded by all as having done what many of us would have done, can considered normal and just, defended their lands, their communities, and their families, defended their way of life. Mr. Speaker, Canadian governments of all kinds can demonstrate a record of continued progress in relationships between Indigenous people and Canada. And certainly, we were proud of some of the strides that we made as the last government in terms of our relationship with First Nations, Inuit, and Métis. Those strides often came with a sorrowful and respectful recognition of wrongdoing on the part of Canada and our forebears. And none, of course, better exemplifies this commitment than the apology to the former students of the residential school, the historic creation of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, the apology for relocation of Inuit families to the High Arctic, and the honouring of Métis veterans at Juno Beach, among other milestones. But the work clearly has not ended, and it must continue. It is appropriate that we work today towards a better understanding between the Silcotine nations and Canada. The Silcotine people of today contribute to the shared prosperity of beautiful British Columbia, a place so many of us are proud to call home. Their historic suffering has been recognized and remembered by successful provincial governments. As the words inscribed on what is today the site of the execution of the former Silcotine chiefs tells us, we must honour those who lost their lives in defence of the territory and the traditional way of life. We recognize the inconsolable grief that has echoed through their nation and reverberates even today. The Supreme Court of Canada's decision of 2014 recognized Aboriginal title for the Silcotin Nation, an important moment for their nation, but one that also recognized them as a century long, centuries long stewards of their beautiful lands. I personally have enjoyed firsthand the majesty of the territory, mountains, rivers, and valleys the abundant wildlife, and of course, the unique and fascinating wild horses. As the wildfires ravaged through last summer, we can understand what a significant impact it was to your people, another loss to overcome. Conservatives also hope that today's apology is an important step for an improved relationship so that all residents of the Chilcotin can live side by side in harmony and enjoy mutual prosperity. We thank and honour the presence of the Silcotine Nation here in the House of Commons today. This is a place where we can help define Canada for this generation and the next. We hope that today and in the future, it can also be a place that the Silcotine too can regard as a place of progress, reconciliation and cooperation. Thank you. Honorable Deputy de Rimouski, Nejet, Mascota, Le Basque. Mr. Speaker, New Democrats welcome and support today's apology and exoneration. We join the government in acknowledging the harm done to the Tsilkotin people prior, during, and since the Chilcotin War of 1864 and 1865. In particular, we want to express our support for the exoneration of the six Silcotin chiefs who were deceived with the false promise of a truce, only put to be wrongfully arrested, tried, and hanged as criminals. Chief Joel Fant said, speaking of today's exoneration, if you come into Silcotin territory, you had to have Silcotin permission. And when the Waddington Road Building crew came in, they didn't get that permission. And when they took our women, abused our women, we declared war on them. The Silcotin people took justified action to defend their territory, and they were met not only with violent ex escalation, but with dishonor. This was a critical event in the Chilcotin War and a blight in the history of British Columbia. But more than that, the violation of the Silcotin people and land 
is part of Canada's legacy of anti-Indigenous colonial violence that still continues today. Depuis bien avant l'arrivée des Européens, la nation de Silcotine vivait au cœur des montagnes et des rivières de l'Ouest canadien, au cœur de la Colombie-Britannique d'aujourd'hui. Depuis bien avant la colonisation, ces communautés partageaient une culture et une histoire commune en prenant soin de leurs terres. Comme ailleurs au Canada, la colonisation a marché sur les terres de la nation de Silcotine, des terres volées sans négociation, sans aucune forme de diplomatie. Comme ailleurs au Canada, la petite Véra l'a sévi. Elle a frappé les peuples autochtones qui n'étaient pas immunisés contre les maladies amenées par les Européens. Et des récits historiques nous permettent de croire que c'était intentionnel. Et comme ailleurs au Canada, des femmes ont été abusées. Les Tsilkotines devaient agir pour défendre leur peuple, pour défendre leur terre. Il y a 154 ans, la guerre de Tsilkotin était déclarée. Au printemps de 1864, l'équipe d'une entreprise de construction de routes a été attaquée. Les colons qui s'étaient illégalement installés en territoire Tsilkotin, avec l'aval du gouvernement colonial de l'époque, ont été chassés. Durant l'été, les chefs ont été invités à négocier la paix. Mais trahison, ce sont les fers au poignet et les barreaux de prison qui les attendaient. Et puis ensuite, la potence. Le sort scellé d'avance, ils ont été jugés pour meurtre, puis pendus. Six, six chefs de la nation Tsilkotin ont été pendus. Four years ago, the government of British Columbia fully exonerated the Tsilkotin chiefs for actions taken in defense of their laws and territories in 1864. On behalf of New Democrats, I echo the BC government's words when I say that these chiefs were not criminals. These chiefs were not outlaws. These chiefs were proud leaders engaged in the defense of their lands and of their peoples. On this day of apology and exoneration, we also want to honor the many Tsilkotin historians, activists, advocates, and knowledge keepers who have continued in the face of overwhelming odds to honor the past and fight for a more just future. This day is a small vindication of your struggles. May it be the first of many more to come. It must be said that this apology and this exoneration are long overdue. But as was noted in the letter of understanding between the Tsilkotin nation and Canada, we recognize that reconciliation begins with truth-telling and healing. So let us continue telling the truth here today. We believe, Mr. Speaker, in justice for indigenous peoples. We believe in reconciliation. We believe it is time to act because indigenous communities cannot wait another 150 years for hope. Because even, when, even these lands on which we stand today, these lands on which I rise in this hallowed chamber, these are the unceded lands of the Algonquin people. Mr. Speaker, unless we continue to tell these hard truths and truly addresses the violence of Canada's ongoing colonial history, we will never be able to heal the trauma left in its wake. And reconciliation will be nothing more than a cruel deception like the one that stole the life of six Tsilkotin chiefs 150 years ago. Monsieur le Président, il est temps de passer de la parole aux actes en matière de réconciliation. Les premiers peuples d'ici ont souffert de 150 ans de colonialisme. Les 150 prochaines années doivent être faites de réconciliation, de respect de la terre, de respect des cultures, de nation à nation. La nation de Tsilkotin et les peuples autochtones ici ont des droits humains qu'il est temps de respecter. On ne peut pas continuer d'ignorer les voix de celles et de ceux qui ont foulé cette terre avant nous. Fighting against fishing rights on the New Channel territory on the west coast of British Columbia is wrong. Fighting survivors of residential schools like the one from St. Anne's is wrong. Leaving 81 First Nation communities on long-term boiled water advisories is wrong. Failing to appropriately address the housing crisis gripping First Nations communities from coast to coast to coast is wrong. Failing to reform a justice system that disproportionately incarcerates indigenous people and exonerates their killers is wrong. A society that turns a blind eye to indigenous women being murdered 
ongoing missing at an alarm, alarming and disproportionate rate is wrong. Real change can't be all talk. La Déclaration des droits des peuples autochtones doit faire force de loi au Canada. Je tiens ici à honorer une fois de plus le travail de mon collègue député David B. Bay James de Nunavik EU, qui mène la charge, notamment pour faire reconnaître les langues autochtones dans l'enceinte de ce Parlement. Il s'agit, Monsieur le Président, d'un élément clé pour la réconciliation. Monsieur le Président, en lisant les, ces mots aujourd'hui, nous sommes probablement en train d'apprendre à plusieurs collègues en cette Chambre l'existence de la nation Tsilkotin et des événements de 1864-65. C'est mon cas. C'est en préparant ce discours que j'ai appris sur la guerre de Tsilkotin et sur la pendaison des six chefs de la nation Tsilkotin. Mon ignorance n'est pas unique au Canada. Nous en savons encore trop peu sur ceux et celles qui nous ont précédés. Nous en savons encore trop peu sur ceux et celles qui ont protégé cette terre, cette terre qui est aujourd'hui la maison que nous partageons. Nous avons un devoir de mémoire, nous avons un devoir de curiosité, nous avons un devoir d'apprendre. Nous avons le devoir de transmettre l'histoire des Premières Nations, des Inuits et des Métis. Mais pour ce faire, nous devons prendre le temps. Nous devons, entre autres, dédier un instant sur le calendrier, consacrer un moment pour mieux connaître et pour mieux comprendre. C'est pourquoi nous appuyons le projet de loi de la députée de Desnethe Mississippi Churchill River visant à faire une journée nationale des peuples autochtones un jour férié au Canada. Following the recommendation of the Truth and Recon Reconciliation Commission, a National Indigenous Peoples Day would be an opportunity to honor the many contributions Indigenous peoples have made to this land and reflect on the many challenges they still face today. A statutory holiday would offer a public opportunity to better understand and ensure Canadians recognize our common history and the legacy of the treaty relationship which remains a vital component of the reconciliation process. This day would allow us to take stock of our, our dark history, like the hanging of six chiefs from the Tsilkotin nation. Mr. Speaker, today's apology of the government of Canada and the exoneration of the Tsilkotin chiefs are welcomed. It's a step in the right direction, and it will hopefully provide some closure, comfort, and peace to the Tsilkotin nation. But the legacy of today's apology will be in the concrete actions this government, and the ones after it, take to build the true nation-to-nation -nation relationship with First Nation, Inuit, and Métis. We cannot continue along the same path we have so unjustly walked for centuries. To the members of the Tsilkotin Nation and other Indigenous representatives in the House today, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for your strength in the face of colonialism. I want to thank you for your de determination to see justice done. I want to thank you for your courage in the face of horrendous acts of violence, ignorance, and denial. Thank you for your patience with our young country as we strive to be better. During my preparation for his speech, Chief Roger William explained that the Tsilkotin don't apologize the same way the English or French do. To apologize, the person must admit that, that they did wrong. We know we have much to do, we have much to do so. We have much to do so that we can all stand on equal footing. But today, I look up to all of you and say to Tsilkotin, Shla Guzu Hacha. We did wrong and we will do better. Thank you. L'honorable député de Mirabella a-t-il le consentement unanime de la Chambre pour qu'il puisse présenter son discours sur ce sujet? Oui, on arrête depuis de me rebattre. Merci, M. le Président. Je suis honoré de prendre brièvement la parole au nom de mes collègues du groupe parlementaire québécois. L'absolution des chefs Tilcotine a une portée symbolique importante. Les événements de 1864 tracent un portrait révélateur du colonialisme au sommet de sa rapacité, avec la ruée vers l'or en trame de fond. Je ne m'attarderai pas sur ces événements, mais je tiens à insister sur l'immense incompréhension au cœur de cette crise. Lorsque des travailleurs affairés à la construction d'une route en plein territoire de Tilcotine ont été tués en 1864, 
les forces coloniales se sont lancées à la recherche de ce qu'ils percevaient comme des meurtriers. C'est fondamental. Lorsque la décision fut prise d'envoyer des milices pour venger les travailleurs, les autorités n'avaient pas la moindre idée de ce qui s'était passé. La correspondance de l'époque fait état d'une incompréhension totale de la crise. Elle ne, faisait pas, elle ne faisait pas état du fait que les constructeurs n'avaient jamais cherché ni obtenu la permission des Tilcotines pour bâtir sur leur territoire. Elle ne faisait pas mention du fait que la nation avait payé cher ses contacts avec les Blancs, ayant perdu la moitié de sa population avec la petite Vérole. Ce n'est qu'au moment de la condamnation à mort des chefs Tilcotines, piégés au cours d'une fausse négociation de paix, que des pistes de réponse ont été révélées pour la première fois. J'aimerais pouvoir affirmer qu'il ne s'agit que du portrait de notre époque où toute communication frôlait l'impossible dans un vaste territoire, un territoire vaste et méconnu, entre interlocuteurs de langue étrangère. Mais encore aujourd'hui, en cette Chambre, on parle de relations de nation à nation, comme s'il s'agissait d'un concept follement avant-gardiste. Établir des relations respectueuses et égalitaires avec ceux et celles avec qui on partage le territoire, ce n'est pas novateur, ce n'est pas visionnaire ni audacieux, c'est le gros bon sens. C'est le respect le plus élémentaire. Ce n'est que sur la base du respect que toute relation peut s'établir. Gardons cette simple réalité en tête pour la suite des choses. En terminant, permettez-moi, M. le Président, de saluer les représentants de la nation Tilcotine, présents ici aujourd'hui. Puissent les tragédies qui ont affligé votre nation être garantes d'un avenir meilleur pour les vôtres et l'ensemble des communautés autochtones du Québec et du Canada. Merci. L'honorable député de Manicouagan a-t-elle aussi le consommant de l'Union de la Chambre? Présenté ce discours. D'accord. Honorable député. Merci, M. le Président. Je suis très heureuse de pouvoir prendre la parole pour répondre à la déclaration du premier ministre. Car aujourd'hui est un grand jour pour la nation Tilcotine qui voit ses chefs de guerre exonérés. Par le gouvernement fédéral, plus de 150 ans après les faits dont nous avons parlé plus tôt. Au nom du Bloc québécois, je tiens à saluer d'emblée la décision du gouvernement, de même que la collaboration entre les chefs, la ministre des Relations couronnes autochtones et tous les partis représentés en cette Chambre quant à l'organisation de cette cérémonie. La présence des représentants de la nation Tilcotine dans ce lieu symbolique témoigne d'un engagement manifeste de tout un chacun à réparer les erreurs du passé. Mais quelle portée doit-on donner à ce geste posé aujourd'hui et qu'est-ce qui doit être fait dans l'avenir? Monsieur le Président, le Bloc québécois souhaite que les relations avec les peuples autochtones soient empreintes de respect. En ce sens, nous croyons que les gestes réparateurs, comme l'exonération des six chefs guerriers de Tilcotine qui ont été arrêtés par le moyen d'un stratagème large, puis condamnés et pendus, constituent un premier pas, humble, dans la bonne direction. D'autres gestes d'exonération devront être posés, une multitude d'autres gestes également. Je pense à Mr. Imasqua, aussi appelé Big Bear, et à plusieurs membres de sa bande qui ont été condamnés pour trahison envers la Couronne en 1885. Je pense aussi à Tipitiwa Anapiwiyin, qu'on surnomme Poundmaker, qui lui a lui aussi été condamné à la même époque, sous les mêmes chefs d'accusation. Je pense à Louis Riel, qui a été pendu le 6 novembre 1885 en vertu d'une loi sur la haute trahison datant du Moyen Âge. Cette date est un jour sombre dans l'histoire du Canada et elle laisse une cicatrice indélébile dans la conscience collective de la nation métisse, de même que dans celle de la nation québécoise. Les hommes que je viens de nommer se sont battus pour leur nation. Nous espérons que le gouvernement ira dans le sens de la réconciliation, en les exonérant aussi. Ce sont des héros, tout comme les chefs Tilcotine, qui ont été injustement condamnés. Le grand chef Klatosin, le chef Biyil, le chef Telad, le chef Takut le chef Chesus et le chef Aoun. Souvenons-nous de leur nom, non comme celui d'un criminel, mais comme celui d'un héros. En terminant, Monsieur le Président, le Canada aura énormément de travail à faire pour laver son passé colonial et pour améliorer les conditions de vie des peuples autochtones. Ceux-ci peuvent compter indéfectiblement sur le Bloc québécois pour être à l'écoute de leurs préoccupations et les appuyer, car nous souhaitons être un acteur positif et constructif en matière de relations avec les peuples autochtones. Nous voulons mettre fin au colonialisme. Nous voulons réparer. Nous nous engageons aussi à être un allié en cette Chambre et ailleurs. Tunash Kumitin, Megwech, Shechanal Laga.
As the Honorable Member for Saanich Gulf Islands also has the unanimous consent of the House to present her comments. Agreed. Honorable Member for Saanich Gulf Islands. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's an indeed an enormous honour to stand here today on the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin peoples to whom we say miigwech for our ability and their generosity that across this country Indigenous peoples have allowed us settler culture people to share territory. We have not done it historically in ways that make us proud. It brings us here today. In the tradition and the language of the Indigenous peoples, in whose great honour it is for me to stand here as the Member of Parliament for Saanich Gulf Islands, it is of course the Wasanich Nation. So in Senchothan, I raise my hands to you, chiefs of the Chilcotin who are here today, and say, Haishka Siam. We hold you in honour and respect and are deeply honored by your presence in this chamber today. And in your own language, it's a great honor and privilege to participate in being able to say that after all these years, more than 150 years of injustice towards six individual chiefs who stood on behalf of their nations against aggression in the way that national leaders do, they are now exonerated of the wrongful charges and the of course, horrific murder of six Chilcotin chiefs in that time of the 1864 Chilcotin War. I appreciate that the Prime Minister referenced the most recent history and the landmark case of the Supreme Court of Canada in 2014. And I know that Chief Joe Alphonse fought so hard on that one. That was a long, long battle to have the land rights of the Chilcotin recognized the Supreme Court of Canada the affront that caused that Supreme Court decision goes all the way back to, eight, to 1983, rather, 1983, 31 years before the Supreme Court decision, the unanimous decision written by former Chief Justice Beverly McLaughlin. But the affront to territory, to land rights, was in granting logging permits to carrier lumber with no consideration that this was territory on which carrier lumber and the British Columbia government had no right to log. 31 years of patience, finally resulting in a unanimous Supreme Court of Canada verdict that said so clearly, quote, title is title is title, unquote. And we are now in a period of trying to right the wrongs. Certainly the 1864 Chilcotin War is one that was replete with wrongs. The, the actions of the chiefs at the time were prompted by not just the presence of a road crew, but the actions of that road crew in abuse and sexual violence against indigenous young women of the Tsilkotin nation, of their abuse of their own workers when they had indigenous workers on their work crew, they were poorly treated and not paid, and ultimately, as is reported in history, the threat that when four bags of flour were stolen, the retaliation from the road crew would be to distribute smallpox infected blankets to cause biological warfare against the Tilkotin nation. We know now, as others have said, how exactly wrong that period in our history was, how long it is in coming, the full legal exoneration of the Tilkotin leadership of that period, and of course, an apology from the Government of Canada, for which I thank the Prime Minister from the bottom of my heart. This is long overdue, but that doesn't take away from the fact that this is an important day. And it is also, I think, important that all parties agreed to the unusual ability of us to have on the floor of our chamber the current Silcotin leadership. This is very important. But I'll turn back to the words of Chief Lotse Sin of saying, quote, we meant war, not murder. And we can say back to him now through the veils of history and time, perhaps reaching him somewhere, that in this settler culture Canada, in this, I hope, post-colonial era, when you say we meant war, not murder, we say now we mean reconciliation. We mean peace. We mean respect. We mean, at long last, the nation-to-nation -nation relationship based on mutual respect and stewardship of our land with the leadership of Indigenous peoples. Again, I say, thank you. 
Megwitch, Cool of Knots Ah. Thank you. I thank the Right Honourable Prime Minister, the Honourable Member for Kamloops, Thompson, Caribou, the Honourable Member for Rimouski, Nejat, Tamasquata, Les Basques, Honourable Deputy de Mirabel, Honourable Deputy de Manicouagan, the Honourable Member for Sandwich Gulf Islands, all for their eloquent words today. Pursuant to order made earlier today, I now invite Peal Lassis of the Socotine First Nation to perform a traditional drumming ceremony. Us ein hein leave, but yes, tick. As told this, Dida. Shall I then me as told ta this I did? See, sir has Jen. Needs ill in hein leave, but shen.
I now invite honorable members to rise, I guess we're already there, while our distinguished guests leave the chamber.